It's summertime. Vacations are happening. People are traveling. How many of you have that one in your family that packs way too much luggage? Don't point at your wives. Uh, But um, we all probably have somebody in our family, or maybe you are the person in your family that just packs way too much stuff. You carry, you know, you know the person that you see walking through the airport, they're by themselves, but they have like six bags dragging behind them, you know, or you know the person that uh, is in your family that you're going away for the weekend and uh, they, I won't use any pronouns, but they bring, uh, they, they, they bring a bag uh, that, that's massive. You're going away for two days, and uh, there's this huge amount of luggage. You know, I remember I was the youth pastor here for 12 plus years and um, went to summer camp with the teens all of those years. And every year, every year, I would sit down with the teenagers before we left and I would give them requirements. Here's how many bags you're allowed to bring. Here are the sizes of the bags that you're allowed to bring. You're going away for one week. You don't need to bring a bag that is massive. And inevitably, there would be at least one teenager, at least one, usually of the female variety, uh, that would bring a bag that undoubtedly could fit a child, um, and most likely you could have probably fit an adult inside of that bag. Uh, But I I was always wondering and baffled by why in the world do you need so much luggage? We're going away for one week. But you know, I think that is illustrative of many of our spiritual lives. You know, we carry around luggage and baggage that is just completely unnecessary for us to carry. Over the next two weeks, I want us to kind of um, address some of these issues, these areas of baggage that maybe we're carrying that if we were to cast them at the feet of Jesus, man, we would experience so much joy in our life. We, We would experience so much freedom in our lives. This week, I want us to talk about the the, the baggage of anxiety and fear and worry. You're in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians is an interesting book. Of course, we know who wrote Philippians. Paul wrote Philippians. When you look at the book of Philippians, the theme of the book of Philippians overall is the theme of joy. It's the theme of rejoicing. Now, the interesting thing about that is that Paul wrote this book from prison. And yet here Paul is in prison and he's writing a book about rejoice in the Lord, have joy in the Lord, remember your joy in the Lord. And he's writing to a church that he founded, that he planted, that he started, and that he knows has many issues. You see, the interesting thing about the church at Philippians is Paul's encouraging them to have joy and to rejoice in the Lord, but they've got a lot of problems. One of the problems that they have, we notice in Philippians chapter 1. One of the problems they have is they're facing some sort of persecution. We don't know exactly how much persecution, but what we do know is that they're facing persecution. In Philippians chapter 1, verse uh, number 27, the Bible says this. It says in verse 27, um, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Verse number 28 says this, And in nothing, terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. In other words, hey, there are people that are your enemies that are seeking to destroy you. But in all of this, I want you to stay joyful. In all of this, I want you to keep your mind as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, verse number 27, he says, only let your conversation, the words that come out of your mouth, the actions that you do in your life, only let that be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And so here Paul is talking to some people in the church at Philippi who are possibly facing some persecution here. We know certainly they have enemies. And he's saying, hey, everything that you do, remember your conversation ought to reflect the gospel of Christ. It ought to be becoming of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know what's unbecoming of the gospel of Christ? Is living under anxiety, living under fear, living living worrying about what the next thing is going to be in our life. So they're facing persecution, but not only are they facing persecution, I think we see in Philippians chapter 3 that they're also facing, uh, fa- facing different trials and, and different um, false teachers that are coming in. 
As you read Philippians chapter 3, we won't take the time to read it all this morning, but there's persecution and now there's false teachers. There, there are people that are coming in and Paul actually calls them dogs. He says, beware of dogs, beware of false teachers, beware of the concision, those that are trying to come in and tear apart the church. And so they're facing persecution, they're facing false teachers, but then as we get into chapter four, which is our text for today, what we see is they're facing disunity in the church. And so lest we approach Philippians chapter four and as Paul gives us what I'm going to call in the title of my message this morning, the antidote to anxiety, lest we approach that and think, yeah, but they didn't have any problems. They didn't have any issues. They didn't have any, any fights going on. They didn't have any persecution. They, yes, they did. They had many, many problems. They had many trials. They had many issues within the church. And so lest we look at them and say, yeah, but they could rejoice, they could have joy because they didn't face the same things that we do today, they certainly did. So before we jump into chapter four and talk about the rest of this passage, let's pray. Let's just ask God to help us as we read this passage and talk about it for a few minutes together today. Father, I pray that you would help us. God, I pray that you would just lead and guide during this message. God, I pray that you would encourage hearts Certainly, God, there's someone here today, without question, that is dealing with anxiety, that is dealing with trials, that's dealing with difficulty in their life and how they're going to handle that. God, I pray that you would give clarity. I pray that you would provide encouragement to that person today. Perhaps there's a multitude of individuals today that are dealing with and living under the circumstances in their life. God, I pray that by the end of this message, we'll come to the place where we can lay those cares and lay those worries at your feet and walk out with a lighter load. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your many blessings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think just for a minute. Before we start, just stop and ask yourself. Over the last two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, month, whatever, what is it that has dominated your thoughts? What worry, what anxiety have you had that is, maybe it's a health diagnosis that you got. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Maybe it's marriage problems. Maybe it's an adult child that has wandered away from God. I don't know what it is in your personal life that is weighing you down or that is causing you anxiety and fear and worry, but what is it? You know, as we look around us today, we have many things to worry about, right? I mean, our world seems out of control. Our country seems like it's falling apart. Persecution seems like it's ramping up against Christian values and Christian ideals. And so there's many things that, if we're not careful, could worry us. But the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 7, casting all your care upon him. Why, church? Because he what? Because he cares for you, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And I think if we could do that, if we could come to the place where we cast all of our cares upon Jesus, that we could stop living under the circumstances of our life and start living above the circumstances of our life. Oh man, what a, what a freeing, what a joyful place to live. You know what anxiety does for us? You know what fear does for us? You know what worry does for us, it saps our joy. It saps our excitement in life. It saps our ability even to serve God in the way that we ought to be serving him. Why? Because we're so worried and we're so consumed and we're so uh, afraid of the, the, the troubles of this life and the things that we can't even control. As you come to Philippians chapter 4, what we find here is Paul giving the antidote to anxiety to this, this church, the church here at Philippi. Look at verse number 1 with me, if you would, in Philippians chapter 4. He says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And now Paul is going to talk about that third problem that I mentioned, but I didn't really talk much about it. Not persecution, which he talked about in chapter 1. Not the false teachers, which he talked about in chapter 3, but now there's disunity in the church. Look at verse number 2. 
There's two ladies here in the church that just aren't getting along for whatever reason. They were useful. They were profitable to the church and not just this church, but also to other churches. He mentions Clement in here. And so they were profitable. But for some reason, these ladies couldn't get along. Look at verse number two. I beseech you, Odeus and Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, yoke fellow. That's the rest of the church. So here's what Paul is saying. Hey, there's these two ladies, Yodius and Syntyche. They can't get along. He doesn't mention why, probably because it's unimportant. The important thing is that they be unified. But he says, I beseech these two women that they get along. And church, by the way, you have a responsibility in helping them to do this. I beseech Yodius and Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, verse 3, true yoke fellow, help those women that labored with me in the gospel and with Clement also with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. These ladies are good ladies, but they can't get along. Something has happened that has created a wedge, that's created some sort of conflict in their life. Maybe, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the color of the carpet in the church or I don't know. But whatever it was, they, they couldn't get along. It's not important. But Paul says, here's the way to fix that. Here's the antidote to anxiety. Here's the antidote to conflict. So notice the first one, number one. The antidote to anxiety, the antidote to worry, the antidote to conflict is to turn your anxiety to rejoicing. Turn your anxiety to rejoicing. What is it that's troubling you today? Just a minute ago, I asked you, think back over the last month, what's the worries, what's the cares, what's the fears that have dominated your life? Is it that health diagnosis? Is it a job that you've lost? Maybe a job that you're trying to find? What is it? Turn your worry, turn your anxiety to rejoicing. Notice what Paul says in verse number four. He says this, rejoice in the Lord, how often? Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And then he repeats it. And again, I say rejoice. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when the times are good. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when your 401k is really healthy. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when your health is great and things are going well. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when your marriage is going well. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when all of your children are serving God. Those are easy times to rejoice. But listen, church, sometimes things get difficult. We face trials. We face difficulties. We face anxieties. And in those moments, it's just as, maybe even more important for us to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And so the antidote to conflict is rejoicing. The antidote to worry is rejoicing. But notice what the Bible says. It says rejoice in whom? The Lord. And so the person in whom we rejoice is the Lord. It's not our spouse. It's not our boss. It's not our children. It's not anybody else that would be a horizontal relationship. It's our vertical relationship, the relationship with the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Why should we rejoice in the Lord? Well, we should rejoice in the Lord because of who he is, because of what he's done for us. What has God done for you? What has God done for you? He provided salvation for you, right? He provided salvation. Psalm 18, verse number two says, the Lord is my rock, the psalmist says. And he's my fortress. He's my deliverer. God, my strength in whom I will trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation. My high tower. The Lord provided your salvation. Not only did he provide your salvation, though, he has provided you protection. In Psalm 91, the psalmist says, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. God has provided you protection. He's provided you salvation. He's provided you protection. He's provided you peace. John 14, 27, Jesus says this, Peace I give to you, or peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why in the world are we living under the circumstances of our life? Why in the world are we living under the anxiety and the pressures of this world when Jesus has promised us peace? When he's given us salvation. He's given us comfort. When he's given us 
peace and protection. In Psalm 23, he says, yea, you know, the, you know the psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And listen, church, we are, prov- we are provided protection, salvation, and comfort by God. We ought to rejoice in those things. Even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of anxiety, we ought to rejoice in the Lord. So who's the person in whom we rejoice? It's the Lord. What is the purpose in which we rejoice or for which we rejoice? Look at verse number four. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Here's the first purpose that we are to rejoice. Number one, because it's commanded of us. This is not a suggestion. This is not Paul. Paul does not say here, hey, it might be a good idea when you face difficulties, when you face trials, when you face conflict, when you face persecution, it might be a good idea if you rejoice in the Lord. Because after all, I mean, maybe God has the answers. No, no, no. Paul says, hey, rejoice in the Lord. And he doesn't stop there. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And he doesn't stop there. He says, and again, I say rejoice. There's no question about this. There's no question as to whom we ought to rejoice in. There's no question as to what we ought to do. And so if you're living under the circumstances of your life today, you're living in the anxiety and the worry and the fear that the world has to offer to you, we are being sapped of our joy. The the, the devil is being allowed to steal our zeal for God. So I wonder, what is it today in your life that you're so worried about? that you're so anxious about. Listen, I'm not saying this morning, I'm not trying to minimize anybody's trials, anybody's difficulties, anybody's problems that you might be facing. Because they're real and they're big, but my God is real and my God is bigger. And your God is real and your God is bigger. And so the problems, the anxieties, the worries of this world, if we'll hand them to him, if we'll lay them at his feet, he can take those things and he can do with them something that I could never do. I can't fix those problems. I can't fix those worries. I can't fix those fears. But God can. And so why in the world are we carrying them around with us today? Why have we not laid them at his feet? Why are we carrying around all of this excess baggage and luggage that we don't even need to be carrying? Because he wants to carry it. He wants to take it. So rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We're commanded to. It's not a request. It's not a suggestion. This is a command, and it's a reiterated command. And in verse number five, there's the second reason that we ought to rejoice, not only because we're commanded to do so, but because rejoicing points others to him. Look at verse five. He says this, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Moderation here, the Greek word carries the idea of gentleness or a humble disposition. Now think back to the context of the passage. In verses two and three, he's just dealt with Yodius and Syntyche who are having conflict, who are fighting with one another over who knows what. But now here in verse five, he says, hey, let your gentleness, let your humble disposition be known to all men because when I am able to be humble, when I'm able to be gentle, when I'm able to surrender my anxieties, my worries, my fears, my conflicts to God and let God handle them and let God take them, then other people take note. Now just think about it. Certainly you've known someone who has faced a trial, a difficulty, specifically I'm thinking right now of a health difficulty, maybe that's been in the hospital, that has lived above the worry that health difficulties can present in our lives, right? What has that done for the nurses and the doctors and the people that are taking care of that person? It's caused them to question. Like how in the world can you be in this state and yet be so joyful? How in the world can you be in this state and yet be so trusting of your God? How in the world? And that's a great opportunity for us to share the gospel with other people. And church, one of our responsibilities, in fact, one of our main responsibilities is what? To build the kingdom of God, right? To lead others to him, to point others to him. And when I give my anxiety and I give my worries and I give my fears over to God and I rejoice in the Lord always and, I, and again I say rejoice and when I can do that, it points other people to him. So again, my question this morning is, 
how are we doing in giving our anxieties and our fears and our worries to God? I don't think any of us like to worry. I don't think there's a person out here that would say, yeah, I want some ulcers, <laughs> right? There's nobody out here that would say, yeah, I want to be anxious about the next shoe that's going to drop in my life. But that's how we often live. Thing, even when things are going well sometimes, right? We're worried about the next bad news that we're going to receive. We're worried about the next bad thing that's going to happen. After all, I mean, the Bible promises us trials, so we are going to face them, so we don't need to worry about them. We don't need to be concerned about them because God is, God is bigger than my trials. God is bigger than my circumstances. And I can live above my circumstances because of that fact. And so why do we rejoice? Number one, we rejoice because we're, command, or we, we're commanded to do so. Number two, we rejoice because it furthers the gospel of Jesus Christ. This word here, let your moderation, verse number five, let your moderation be known unto all men, describes a person who is freely let go of all the things that cause him stress, all the things that cause him worry, all the things that cause him anxiety, because he knows that the Lord will take up his cause. So have we done that today? So number one, turn your anxiety to rejoicing. Number two, turn your anxiety to prayer. Look at verse number six. Verse number six says this, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So this word careful, it's not the same word that we would say to our kids. Like, hey, be careful, you're going to fall off that ledge. Or be careful, you're going to burn yourself on that hot stove. That's not the same word here. The word is the, has the idea of being anxious. Or even has the idea of being pulled in two different directions. And how often is this us? When we're anxious, when we're worried, we're pulled in two different directions. Because I think genuinely, as Christians, we want to be here where we're casting our cares at the feet of Jesus and where we're, we're, we're letting go of all of the worries and the strife and the <coughs> struggles that we have in this life. I think that's where we want to be. But we're pulled in this direction where we feel like I'm the one that has to fix this and I'm the one that has to make this right and I'm the one that has to worry about this. And we're pulled in these two different directions. If you have kids, you understand this, right? Because oftentimes, you're pulled in two different directions by your kids. We just spent a couple of weeks uh, in an RV, and um, that was a, a fun experience. Um, definitely some pulling in different directions during that time. Uh, you'd have one kid in the back screaming, Dad, he hit me, and another kid in the front screaming, Dad, he called me a name at the same time, and you just want to kind of run away from that situation, right? And so, but, but... When, when you have kids, you cannot kind of understand this. How many of you played with the, uh, the, the Stretch Armstrong um, figure when you were kids? Okay, remember Stretch Armstrong? You got one person on one arm, one, another person on another arm, and you just like kept pulling them, kept pulling them, kept pulling them, and somehow, some way, that thing never broke. Um, at least it never broke on me. But you could pull that thing in two different directions, and it never broke. But as, as individuals, as human beings, we can't always be pulled in two opposite directions and never break. At some point, we break. And at some point, we either surrender to God or we just keep worrying ourselves sick. At some point, we either surrender to God or we come to the place where the devil gets a hold of our life through our anxiety and through our fear and through our worry. And oftentimes, we don't look at this as sin, but let's call it what it is this morning. It's sin because we have been commanded in Scripture to cast all of our cares upon him. We've been commanded in Scripture to rejoice always in the Lord. We've been commanded in Scripture to be careful for nothing, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. But yet so often, we worry and we worry and we worry and it never gets fixed because we never surrender it to God. So what is it this morning that you're worrying about? So he says, be careful, be anxious for nothing. Jesus reiterated this. Go to Matthew chapter 6 real quick. Matthew chapter 6. Because Jesus said some of the same, same things in Matthew chapter 6. He's preaching the Sermon on the Mount. As you know, the, the, the famous verse uh, there in verse number 24, no man can serve two masters, either he will hate the one and love the other. 
You know, serve the one, not the other. You can't serve God and mammon, right? He's talking about money. But then he transitions in verse number 25, and he talks about worrying about tomorrow. So look at verse number 25 of chapter 6. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or not, for, not, not yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Now, just think about it. When was the last time that you saw a bird stressed out? Honestly. When was the last time? Like you looked outside and that bird was there like, I don't know where I'm going to get my next uh, little stick to build my nest. Or I don't know where I'm going to get my next worm to feed my little birdie. Um, is that what you call a baby bird? Um, whatever. <laughs> but when was the last time that you saw a bird like stressed out? Never. You don't see birds stressed out. Why? Because they know that God's going to provide for them. But yet when was the last time that you saw the person sitting next to you stressed out? Probably this morning. Because they couldn't figure out what piece of clothing to put on to come to church that was in their closet full of clothes, right? I mean, we so worry and stress ourselves out over things that God's got, over, thing that, over things that, that, that God has control over. Look at the rest of the passage here. Verse 27, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to a stature? Hey, you can't do anything about it, so why worry about it? You can't fix it, so why worry about it? And why take your thought for the raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. The flowers, they're not stressed out either. They just grow. They just do their thing. God cares for the flowers. He provides them rain. He provides them water. He provides them the things that they need. They're not worried about it. They're not stressed out. They're not anxious. They're not fearful. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Hey, if God takes care of the birds, if God takes care of the grass, if God takes care of the flowers, how much more is God going to care for you, his creation, a human being? Verse number 30, or verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall, ye, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after thee, all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But, in verse 33, but seek ye first what's important. Hey, don't worry about the problems. Don't worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow. Don't worry about your 401k. Don't worry about the things that you can't control. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things Amen. shall be added unto you. Amen. All these things shall be added. Because you know what? My God is big, and your God is big, and he's way bigger than our problems, and he's way bigger than our worries, and he's way bigger than our cares, and he's got them under control. So what is it? What is it in your life that God has under control, but you are so worried about? You can't fix it. You can't change it. You can't do anything to make it better. But God can. And he will. If we'll trust him. But so often we walk through this life with this baggage and this luggage that is so unnecessary and we don't need to carry because God has invited us to, to, to lay it at his feet but we're not doing it. So be careful for nothing, but in everything, he says, by prayer. So what's the antidote to anxiety? What's the antidote to worry? It's rejoicing, it's prayer. What is prayer? Well, prayer is a continual practice of my life. Prayer is worshiping him. Think about the model prayer. How does the model, model prayer start? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? So the, the beginning of the model prayer is worship to God. That's how we ought to pray. And when I pray and I worship God, you know what that does? That makes all of my worries that are really big become much smaller. That makes all of my problems that are really big become much smaller. 
Because I realize that the God that I'm praying to is omnipotent. I realize that the God that I'm praying to is omnipresent. I realize that the God that I'm praying to is almighty. I realize that the God that I'm praying to knows the very hairs of my head. And for some of us, that's a lot easier than others. But he also knows the sands on the seashore. And the God that we pray to is much bigger than any little problem that I might have. And when I worship him, when I talk to him, it helps me to understand that. But you know, so often, we don't do that. So often, we try to fix it. Oh, it's a problem, and now I've got to fix it. It's a problem, and now I've got to make it right. But it's out of our control. We can't. So why worry? How many of you ever lost your keys? How many of you are habitual key losers? Okay, I know we have some in here. Um, you lose your keys... What's always the first response? I got to find them, right? I lost my keys. Where did I put them? Okay, let me retrace my steps. I think I came from the car and I had a bag of groceries. Maybe it's in one of the bags of groceries. No, no, no. I think I might have put it in my purse. No, it's probably in my coat pocket. No, maybe, uh, you know, we, we retrace our steps. We try to figure it out on our own. Now, how many of you have ever lost keys? You've looked for the keys for an hour plus. You can't find them. And then you finally decide, you know what I should do? Maybe I should ask God to show me where those keys are. Have any of you ever been in that situation? Have any of you immediately, after you ask God to show you where those keys are, found the keys? Maybe not immediately, but maybe within a few minutes. Okay? If God cares about lost keys, how much more does God care about your health? If God cares about lost keys, how much more does God care about resolving your marriage? If God cares about your lost keys, how much more does God care about your provision, your protection, I'm just saying, if we pray about things rather than worry about things, maybe it would lighten our load so that we can serve God a whole lot better. But so often we immediately turn to, how can I fix this? How can I find the keys? How can I retrace the steps? Rather than saying, God, I need you to help me. God, I need you to show me. God, I can't do anything about this. God, I'm putting this in your hands. God, I'm dropping this at your feet. God, this burden is now yours. Release me from it but yet we like to carry it. We like to let it steal our joy. But Paul says over 15 times in the four chapters of Philippians to rejoice or to have joy in the Lord. That's no coincidence. It's no coincidence that here's a church who's facing trial and difficulty and circumstances that they could live under, but Paul is encouraging them, live above these things. You're better than this. And your God is bigger than this. And so he says, pray. Back in verse number six of Philippians chapter four, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer. It's a worshipful practice. Worship, worship, it drives out worry. Worship and worry can't coexist in a life. And when I worship, then my worry is driven away. When I worry, then my worship is driven away because they won't coexist. They can't coexist in your life. So are you worshiping or are you worrying? Because they can't live together in harmony. Freedom from anxiety comes when I spend more time on who he is and less time on what my problems are. Let me say that again. Freedom from anxiety comes when I spend more time dwelling on who he is and less time worrying about what my problems are. That's when I can become free from anxiety. That's when I can become free from worry and fear. But I want you to see what else. Not only should we turn our anxiety to prayer, but we should also turn our anxiety to petition. Look at the rest of that verse. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Asking God. This is a strong crying out to God. This is an emotional cry to God. God, please help me. I can't fix this situation. It goes back to the key illustration. We're just so consumed with what we can fix and what we can do. Maybe we just need to cry out to God, God, please help me. God, please answer this request. And maybe God won't always answer the request the way that we want it to be answered. Maybe God won't always answer the request in the timing that we want him to answer it. But God will always answer. God will always answer. You know, we were um, out west recently and um, we were... We were on a hike, and we were hiking through um, 
some mountains that had a, a pretty, pretty strong river flowing through them. And, um, you know, it was a river that you certainly wouldn't want to get in and swim in. It was somewhat dangerous. And the flow at, at this particular spot that I'm talking about wasn't white water, but it was certainly strong currents. It was certainly a strong, a strong rapids uh, going through there. And so there's a bridge where you walk over to get to the other side of the river. And so we were walking over that bridge. And I actually, this was one of those moments where I had been pulled in two different directions and I had run away. Um, not really, but I did have one of the kids with me. The rest of the kids were back with, uh, with Danielle. And and they were walking over the bridge and I'm sitting on a rock because they're taking forever to come. I'm like, what in the world are they doing? I'm just sitting there waiting, waiting patiently, um, as I always do. Um, but I'm sitting there waiting patiently for them to come. And uh, finally, probably 15 or 20 minutes later, I see them come around the bend. Maybe, maybe that was a little bit of an exaggeration, but it was a long time, okay? I see them come around the bend and I see one of my boys in the back. You could tell he was visibly upset. Like, not angry, but he was sad and disappointed, visibly. And then I looked at his face, and I realized something was missing. His glasses. His glasses were gone. And so he's standing up on top of the bridge, looking down, watching the water flow underneath of it, and his glasses fell off of his face, and he smacked the glasses trying to grab them, and they fell into the river. Certainly, at this point, these glasses are gone. I mean, the, the, the water's flowing fast, and so they come, and... Danielle says, your son dropped his glasses in the water. And I thought, well, um, I guess he's just not going to see the beauty that all of us are going to see for the rest of the trip. Too bad. Um, so we went back, and uh, he said, I think I know where they went in. And I said, son, the glasses are gone. This water is, is raging. I mean, there's no way we're going to find this. Dad, please, just try to get my glasses. So I reached down. Nope, don't have them. Sorry, they're gone. He said, no, 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 I'm pretty sure they're right behind that rock. And I said, there's no possible way that those glasses fell behind that rock. And even if they are, they're clear framed. This is clear water. There's no possible way that we're going to be able to find your glasses. So Danielle, in the meantime, went back up onto the bridge and she's looking down in the water. And she says, just reach behind that rock right there because I think I might see something. I'm like, whatever. So I reach down there, nothing. I come back up empty handed. Nope, sorry, no glasses. And she said, no, 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 just a little to the right. I think I might see something. So I reach back down there. And sure enough, I pulled out the glasses. And oh, ye of little faith, right? I'm like, those glasses are gone. There's no possible way we're finding those glasses. And I pull them out, and Danielle said, that is a miracle from God, because I just prayed, and I asked God to show us where those glasses were. And I'm, of course, immediately I'm struck with conviction, and, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible person. But it's certain, I'm telling you, I'm telling you she's right. It was a miracle from God, because there is no possible way that we should have been able to find those glasses. But she prayed, and she asked God to show us where the glasses were, and it was a miracle even that the glasses were in that same spot. I'm telling you. I know you can't understand the gravity of it because you weren't going to have to pay for the lost glasses, uh, and also you weren't there to see the river, but that I, it was a miracle that we were able to find those glasses. And so he got the glasses back. But if God cares about little, little glasses so that people can see, and, and I, I firmly believe that that was a, a miracle from God. That was provision from God because of prayer, because of supplication, because of asking. If God cares about that, again, how much more, how much more does God care about the big problems that we face in our life? And there's some of you here this morning that you're facing some big problems. There's some of you here this morning that you're facing some things that seem insurmountable. You're facing some things that seem like there's no possible way that there's going to be a resolution to this relationship. There's no possible way that there's going to be a resolution to this health issue. There's no possible way that there's going to be a resolution to my family quarrel. There's no possible way. Can I tell you, with God, all things are possible. Because we serve an almighty God. So turn your anxiety to prayer. Turn your anxiety to worship. But finally, turn your anxiety this morning to peace. Look at verse number seven. It says, in the peace of God. Oh, by the way, I can, pr I, I can pray. I can petition. I can praise God. I can ask God for certain things, but you know what I can't do? I can't produce peace in my life, but you know who can? God. And the Bible says in verse number seven, the peace of God that passes all understanding 
shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. You see, the peace of God is different than the peace with God. And many of us, most of us probably in this room this morning, have already experienced peace with God because I experience peace with God when I accept him as my personal savior. No longer am I at war. No longer am I fighting with him. Now I have peace with him, the peace that Jesus talked about uh, in that verse that we read a few minutes ago in Matthew chapter 6, the peace that Jesus talked about that he left for us. But there's some of us in this room that maybe, perhaps, you've never, you've never been saved. And maybe this morning you're, taught, you're sitting here thinking, how in the world can I have the peace of God if I don't even know God? And the answer is you can't. The answer is you can't. Because not everybody can experience the peace of God if they don't come to have peace with God first. So perhaps this morning you've never been saved. Perhaps this morning you don't have peace with God. You say, well, how in the world do I do that? Well, it's very simple. The Bible tells us that all are sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that every single one of us in this room have sinned and we've fallen short of God's, God's standard for our lives. So, man, that's kind of hopeless. Well, no, it's not because Romans chapter 6 tells us that the wages or the payment or what I deserve because of my sin and because I've fallen short of God's standard is death. But... The Bible says, but the gift of God, what's a gift? It's free. I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to do anything for it because somebody's already paid for it for me. And that was Jesus Christ. The gift of God is, is peace. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You say, well, how do I accept that gift? It's real simple. Romans chapter 10 says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you'll believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Ephesians chapter 2 says, it's by grace that we're saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing you can do to save yourself from your sin, nothing. Jesus has already done it for you. Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah for the cross. So this morning, you can experience the peace with God, and you can experience the peace of God, but not until you've experienced peace with God. And so the Bible talks about this peace of God. What is it? The peace of God, the Bible, the Bible says in verse number seven, that passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. This is a blessing that comes from God when I surrender all aspects of my life to him. And this can only happen when I surrender all aspects of my life to him. So what about it this morning? What's the worry? What's the anxiety? What's the fear that's plaguing your mind because you haven't surrendered it to God so you aren't experiencing the peace of God in your life? You can and you will if you would surrender that worry to him. The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds. That word keep there has the idea of guarding. Can you imagine this? This is amazing. Jesus, Jesus, the God of the universe, standing guard in front of your heart and in front of your mind saying, worry, fear, go away. This is not a place where you live. This is my home. This is my child. You don't belong here. Jesus will keep your hearts and minds. He will protect your hearts and minds. The peace of God that passes all understanding, but it can only happen when I'm fully surrendered to him. Then look at verse nine and we're done. Verse eight, excuse me, and we're done. Finally, brethren, he says, hey, okay, fear, worry, anxiety, those things, don't let them be a part of your life. Rejoice in the Lord, pray, ask, seek God's face. Experience the peace of God. Don't dwell on the negative thoughts of life. Don't dwell on the thoughts that Satan wants you to dwell on. But finally, brethren, think on these things. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any, if there be any praise, think on these things. And so let's turn our thoughts to true and honest and just and virtuous and praiseworthy things and forget about the things that plague our mind because God's got you. We'll close with this thought, Daniel chapter six. Go there with me if you would, real quick. You know the story, but Daniel's taken from his homeland as a teenager, taken to Babylon, taken to a place of wickedness, taken to a place that he doesn't know. 
But Daniel doesn't allow this to sidetrack him. Daniel doesn't allow this to steal his joy, to sap his energy, to make him stop serving God. Why? Because Daniel rejoices in the Lord. And in chapter 6, Daniel has been promoted to a place of leadership in the kingdom. And there's other princes, there's other people in the kingdom that don't like him. So they want to get him. They want to kill him. So they come up with this idea. Hey, King Darius. Nobody should be praying to any other God except for you, King Darius. How about you sign a decree that for 30 days, nobody can pray to any other God except for you? Okay, well, let's do that. So King Darius signs the decree. Nobody can pray. For 30 days, nobody can pray to any other God except for me. You know what Daniel does? He doesn't worry. He doesn't live in fear. He doesn't cower and go shut his windows and crawl down into his basement and pray to God. No, he flings open his windows. In verse number 10, the Bible says this. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and he prayed and gave thanks as he did aforetime. Daniel did not lose his joy in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that circumstance. He lived above the circumstance and not under the circumstance and his life. You know what happens? He gets caught. The guys go back. They run and tell the king, hey, king, he's praying. He's praying to his God. He's not praying to you. You need to go, and you need to throw him into the lion's den. So you know what happens? He does. Daniel, sorry, you prayed. I hate to do this. I really do. I really like you. I don't want to do this, but you got to be thrown into the lion's den. He throws him into the lion's den. Pick it up in verse number 18. Verse number 18. The king went to his palace, and he passed the night. This is while Daniel's in the lion's den. He passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. What does that sound like? Anxiety, worry, fear. What have I done? And so the interesting and ironic thing about this this situation here is that Daniel, who's in the lion's den, is sleeping soundly with the lions. He's having a good old time down there, worshiping God and, and enjoying, enjoy, enjoying the presence of the lions. And here the king is. He can't sleep. He's fasting. He's not listening to any music. It's a terrible night for him. And he comes back to the, to the den uh, in the morning, and he says, Daniel, Daniel, are you still alive? Was your God able to protect you? And Daniel looks up at the king, and he says, O king, live forever. My God has protected me. My God is bigger than lions. My God is bigger than anxiety. My God is bigger than worry. My God is bigger than fear. My God is bigger than any problem that I may ever face. So what about it, church? What's the anxiety that's plugging you today? What is it that's just eating you alive that you haven't given to God? Casting all your care upon him because he cares for you.